And this guy brings me this really cool deal. It's in an up and coming neighborhood in Miami. He says, I'm going to run it. You raise the money. So I put together a book. I stay at my office every day real late and I go out and I raise my money around it. We sign a contract together. We're joint and several on the contract. And I come to say, I got the money. He goes, yeah, well about that. I have an investor that I think would be more strategic for me. And I'd like to go in that direction. Welcome back to Lifetime Cashflow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, we have an interesting topic to discuss today. It's BTR or build to rent, which is something I'm actually very interested in personally. I think it's a fantastic business model because it kind of ties into what I did in the past, although much smarter than how I did it. Uh, but I've got Adam Wolfson in here today. And uh, Adam is the CEO of Wolfson BTR. And uh, they've got 2,000 um, homes in a pipeline in this build to rent model. So we're going to, we're going to dig into this because I, I am actually very excited about it personally. Welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, why don't you give us a little background on, you know, maybe where you came from, how you ended up in, in this. Uh, I, I, I read your bio, but I, I won't do it any justice. Very, very interesting and very impressive actually. So why don't you tell us who you are? Sure. So, um, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in the suburbs of Metro Detroit, a place called Bloomfield Hills. Mm -hmm. um, spent most of my time there. I went to the University of Michigan and then wound up um, moving to Miami about 16 years ago in the Great Recession. Right. And um, while the bio is certainly written in a way to suggest it was all sort of uh, trending upward, mm -hmm. you know, I probably had seven different jobs since I moved to Miami. Um, and just sort of worked my way up through different commercial real estate groups, learning as I went and, um, you know, consistently trying to just understand more about the business, um, taking a bigger title as I went. And then at some point, I wound up coming across this piece of land in Bradenton, Florida. Um, and this is before the term BTR existed. There was no build to rent. Mm -hmm. um, a family partner of mine owned this piece of land and he was underwater trying to sell it to D.R. Horton. And D.R. Horton was, you know, giving him the run around there. And turns out that uh, he was kind of stuck. And so he said, can you take a look at this? And I was finally at a point in my career where I could underwrite. I knew how to use Excel well. I knew how to pitch institutional investors. And, you know, I, I sort of took a step back and I said, well, this is supposed to be a townhome community for sale. I couldn't get a deal done for the life of me at that time because cap rates were going to crazy places and you didn't want to really chase that down. But I had the idea to throw this into my multifamily development model and it shot back a seven and a half untrended yield on cost. And to put that in perspective, we were doing deals at sixes and which were really five nines, five eights when you dug into the underwriting. And that's sort of what the spread was. When I dug in further and realized I was using vertical construction numbers for this thing and I dialed in the right numbers, it was an eight and a half untrended. And I said, mm. this is interesting. Yeah. This is what I need to do. By the way, guys, just to backtrack for a half a second. So he was trying to sell it to D.R. Horton. They're a builder. Okay. So he's trying to sell it to, to basically a builder. Yeah. He couldn't sell it. Um, you ran the models on this, um, and and you're saying you were doing vertical, meaning multiple story. Is that what you're saying in yeah. the multifamily space, right? And then you realized, you know, you're building single family. It's it's a totally different model, and and you can price it a hell of a lot more reasonably. Correct. It, that's that's to summarize what you just said. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think we were running costs at about two hundred and forty dollars a foot on right. net foot, right? And it was about a hundred bucks a foot less to build the single family homes. I think the cost that the public builder eventually had to they, their direct cost to build these units was about 64 65 dollars a, a square foot right. wow that's a hell of a price right man i'd love to build for that Holy right cow, i'd build everything i could get my hands on can't do that anymore no. now now i think okay. your, your your net foot these days is probably give or take 100 yeah, yeah, not yeah. 90 to 100 yeah I would do that all day long. I was telling you before we started recording, I, I want my son to get his general contractor's license so we can build some stuff down here to rent. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I love the model. And so you uh, you went to school in uh, 
Ann Arbor is yeah. that where it was? Go blue. You know who my you know who my first interview was? No. Uh, Albert Barris. Do you know that name? He owned McKinley Corporation. Owns it. Sure. A huge company. He was there. an ambassador, right? Yeah, yeah. He's okay. yeah. He's he's huge up there, okay. and he's a billionaire. It's a really yeah. funny funny story. I just as an aside. Uh, he he came and spoke or spoke at my mastermind. I have a host of mastermind of multifamily okay. operators, and uh, and uh, I, my assistant called his assistant and said, "Yeah, we're going to fly Albert down. We're going to first class. We're going to put him up at the Ritz Carlton." And his assistant's like, "Nah, he'll take his own jet down. It's fine." Yeah, so. <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, baby." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's really funny. He was my first interview. I'm an hour in. I realized I forgot to hit the record button. Oh, come so on. we were talking about you starting a podcast. Please remember to hit the freaking record button. <laughs> yeah, he was really cool about it. Oh my God, I was mortified. Anyway, so you bought this this Bradenton piece of property. You developed it. Uh, let's continue with that story. So sure. So so I wound up um, partnering oh. with a large SFR operator at that time. Single family rental. Operator. Single family homes for rent operator. Mm -hmm. um, wound up actually working for them as their chief investment officer, managing mm -hmm. a portfolio of about four thousand homes while nice. standing up this build to rent business. Nice and. Um, so we we partnered with, with with one of the big publicly traded builders. Okay. They financed it. They built it for us. They got to count it as sales um, mm -hmm. on their end. And then right as we're about to break ground on this thing, you know, we need to show essentially what our takeout financing is going to look mm -hmm. like. And so we go to the debt markets. The debt markets have no idea what to do with this thing mm -hmm. because you're going to be delivering vacant units one at a time right. over the course of a year and a half. Right. They've, they, Unlike a multifamily project that you develop. Right. right. Multifamily, the difference is when you deliver a multifamily project, you essentially have your construction loan and you're going to lease up the, the the property while you have your construction loan. Mm -hmm. And then once you're 90 for 90, right? And like 90% right. occupied for more and than 90 days. Fanny conforming right. debt or Freddie. You, you yeah. refinance into a more permanent solution. Mm -hmm. This needed something in between, which mm -hmm. is one of the nuances of these BTR deals. You're not dealing with a typical construction lender. Right. And so you have to find somebody who's willing to step in in the middle. They're going to take risk that's a little bit less than construction risk because they don't have to build. The units are complete, mm. but they're not going to have a stabilized unit. So they have to step in essentially as a bridge, and that's what it's become. Uh, the, so what it's bridge it. debt. You had to it's get bridge to do debt. this. Right. And so we had to convince essentially an SFR lender, a single family homes mm -hmm. for rent lender, because a lot of those guys were, were giving the larger companies these lines they could use to go buy from, you know, three homes here from DR. Uh, two homes there from Lennar, five right. from Pool, and so they had these lines, and we said, "Guys, it's the it's the same thing." Right. And they they finally you know scratched their heads as big institutions do, and they came back and they said, "Okay, we can do this." And so as well, we're listen, let me just give you kudos, okay? Because you you could have just said, "Oh, this isn't going to work," and you just went in there and and you had to sell them on this and and convince you know people that have done things the same way forever that there's a different way to you know to skin a cat here. I appreciate that, it, but yeah. it. We, we can go backwards in a minute because the story I was telling you where we started underwriting this, it became so clear that this was going to happen. Right. Right. That there's no there's no way they should say no. This is the same as what they're doing. It wasn't like, let me try to get them to say yes. It's guys, this is the same. Right. There's no reason you would say no. You couldn't you couldn't justify. Saying when, no. when you approach it with that certainty, then it's done. Right. You know, that's that's good. Awesome. And, and so. um we wound up getting a few lenders to to give us uh, quotes on this thing, to give us term sheets. And one of them was um, uh, J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Mm -hmm. I can say it now because we wound up selling to them. Mm -hmm. And as we're going through the, the process of sort of negotiating a term sheet on lending, they came back to us at one point and said, can we just buy this from you? No kidding. <laughs> so, uh, well, let, let me see what that looks like. And so they they gave us an offer for it and we went back and forth a little bit. And I said, you know what? This is the first deal at the time I needed the money, right? right. I, I still need the money. Right. But but at the time, like this was going to give me what I needed to sort of start a company and go. And so while I'd like to have kept that unit, yeah. and in hindsight, their rents ran 35% during COVID. Right. You know, they, they made, I think they did a lot better than what they were underwriting. But, um, you know. Well, we've seen this, this, this MSA went up 30%. The rents went up 30% in one year. Right. Like I was, I was 23 20, or 22. Yeah. So yeah, it was a home run for yeah. them, but, but it was exactly what you needed. And you know, it, the parallel, sorry to interrupt here, but the yeah. parallel is for people starting out in my business, the multifamily space, you know, if you, if you can do a quick sale on something early on that sets you up for future success, that's a no brainer. Even if you have to take it in the shorts a little bit, it's a no brainer. Yeah. And, and you know, like I said, I, I would, I would love to still have that. Yeah. Um, but in selling that, 
we wound up raising a fund right after it because our investors knew exactly what what they were going to be getting. Right. Right. We we knew before we put a shovel in the ground what our cost was because we had a GMP out of the public builder. They couldn't come back to us for more. Right. And we knew what we were What's selling. What's a GMP? A guaranteed maximum price contract. Okay. Guaranteed they, they, maximum price. Yeah. Good. They mean nothing anymore oh. because after you know after um, all the um, inflation in costs. Oh, with the building building and uh, cost of building supplies. Right. Yeah. And so all the GCs that used to give them, they'll still give them to you, but they're not going to go out of business and lose their homes. Right. To, right? So at a certain point, when costs go up 20, 30%, right. like they did um, post-COVID, they're right. going to come back to you and say, guys, we need to talk. Right. Right. And let's find a way through this. Right. Um, very different from what was before that. They could eat 5%. Right. You know? Right, 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 right. Yeah. Now, I remember seeing a, a post on social media where uh, where people were, uh, you know, this is my this is my wealth creation to be a pile of wood. You know, yeah. <laughs> back then it was crazy what happened there. So, so you sold it to J.P. Morgan Chase. Yeah, had a nice hit, and you're off and running. Off and running. Okay. And so, talk about some of the other projects that you've got going. I want to drill down on this a, quite a bit more. So, just so you guys know, so build to rent is you basically building up a, a home subdivision and you're renting it. Okay, and. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's just uh, taking what we're doing in the multifamily space and spreading it out. And, you know, and, and I was saying saying this to you before we started. I mean, people would much rather live in a house than a freaking apartment any day of the week. And so, you know, obviously you, there's going to be a, I'm sure, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's going to cost more to live in a house than it's going to cost to live in an apartment. But, you know, people really like it. And you're mm. focused here in Florida, correct? Southeast U.S., but I have not been able to get a project on the books that's outside of Florida. We've gotcha. chased a lot of them, but mm. um, all of our pipeline is here in Florida. Okay. So okay. talk talk about the different projects you've got going right now. All right. So we have a 350-unit deal in um, Daytona Beach, Ormond Beach, that oh, nice. will break ground on in the next, call it, six to nine months. Mm. Um uh, do you do the entitlement and all that stuff when correct. you get the land? Yeah. Okay. We, we, our, where we've really been able to create value um, is is in buying the land, right? Mm -hmm. And our fund allows us to buy the to buy the dirt. Mm -hmm. Most of the the groups out there that are going to get sort of institutional capital, they can't deal with the entitlement process. They can't deal with because uh, you know, of the time constraints. The time constraints and the uncertainty and the and the sort of pain in the ass of dealing with you know local governments, right? right? You, you've got You've got um, uh, stormwater management, so you got your local water management district. You mm -hmm. got to dig enough lakes to deal with the right. runoff that you're going to create. You've got wetlands, so um, in the wetland process, it used to be the Army Corps of Engineers that you deal with, right. um, which was a treat. And then, yeah, sure. um, you know, they uh, off uh, sort of outsource that over to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection (FDEP). Oh, lovely. They then got hit recently with a lawsuit. Um, by some groups in D.C. saying, hey, you're doing it wrong. You're not protecting the, spe protecting the species down there, the, the endangereds. And so they halted everything, and now you have to run everything back through the Army Corps of Engineer. Mm -hmm. um, those kinds of things come up all the time. You've got bald eagle's nests that can appear. You've got gopher tortoises. There's any <laughs> number of things. And that's you know, assuming that your project is entitled and zoned for what you want locally. You right. may have to go through some of that. And our fund has really allowed us to sort of get in early and create value and spend the two years that it takes mm. to go through those processes. And so, you know, it looks like all these things come up overnight and everybody has a groundbreaking ceremony. But in reality, our projects are two years, two years in the get. making. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say you create value right out of the gate, could you elaborate on what you mean by that? Yeah. When Just you, by, by buying it right? It, by buying it right. But so, so if you go in and buy an entitled piece of dirt from right. someone, like if I were to go out and sell the, the land that I bought and spent two years and half a million dollars uh, getting entitled, right? These are sites that are 50 acres, 30 acres, 200 acres in some cases. And so you're going through and spending money on um, Roads and sewer lines oh, and all be, that. Uh, yeah. Before that, oh. um, land use attorneys, oh. engineers, architects to put things together, um, lobbyists to help you when you need it. With, oh, no kidding. Yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, you've got to go through these processes. And, the, you know, you're, you're, you're putting a site plan together. You're literally taking a piece of dirt that is essentially raw and saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. 
And then you've got to get that approved at every different level, the, the local level, like I was saying. So they approve your roads and sewers and where you're going to be putting the houses and the densities and the heights and the colors and the trees and the landscaping. Wow. Right. So that's yeah. how you create the value. Correct. OK. It's, yeah. You haven't even sh picked up a shovel yet. You've just Correct. basically got it in tight. That's what it means. OK, yeah. well, this is this is news for me, too. So this is very interesting. So. You've got that one. Where else have you? You mentioned some other stuff. Yeah, so we sold the 184 units right. uh, just down the street in Bradenton, Florida. We've got another 274, uh, 274 units that will break ground in the next two to three months um, just north of Bradenton and Palmetto. Oh, yeah. Um, we have another project, um, about 80 acres in Bradenton as well. Mm. Bradenton's been very good to us. Yeah, uh, wow. It's a great market here. Yeah. Um, we have another... Oh, just under 70 acres that we bought in Fort Myers, where we'll be breaking oh. ground in about 304 townhomes um, in the coming two to three months there. Wow. It's got a second piece there that we'll either do as a multifamily of 300 units or a cottage style BTR, which is a little bit different. We can get cottage into Cottage style, what does that mean? So most of what we've been doing, B BTR, um, and maybe we take built a step back, rent. built mm -hmm. to rent, mm -hmm. generally refers to entire communities of homes for right, rent. Right, like it's, a subdivision of homes, basically. Right, it's, right. it's essentially the cousin of multifamily because those are usually studios ones and twos, right? right? They're for rent, but they're centrally managed. Right. And single family homes, which are scattered all right. over the place, SFR for rent. Right. And so those things are sort of put together. Now within Build to Rent, BTR, there's really sort of two camps. One is the individually platted Right. So each house has a tax folio, which is what we're doing. Oh, it's, and, okay. So, we, oh, no kidding. So each house has separate taxes. That's how we've done it. Interesting. Yeah. So if you ever want to sell, you can sell individually. Right. That's smart. That's great for so, an ultimate ex, uh, or alternate exit plan. Correct. Right. And so the investment and, and honestly, now you're going to pay more in taxes that way. Likely. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it's a, it's great to have that second exit plan. Yeah. yeah. And so a lot of the institutions, they'll check that box at investment committee, knowing that they'll probably never use it. But investment Never committee, what? I'm sorry. the exit as um, oh, got multiple it. As different that, units. As that alternate yeah, exit. Yeah, because they right. look at it as NOI divided by cap rate, right. which is how they're going to sell this thing in the end. But if they ever had to, and now it's honestly, right now is the only time it's ever really gotten close where the value for the retail home might exceed the value of the cap rates, right? Because cap rates blew out when debt got more expensive. Right. And so it it finally got a little close. I think that's turning the other way. But anyway, build to rent has really two different types of, of executions. One is that individually platted mm -hmm. where you're essentially building three, four, five bedroom homes or townhomes. Mm -hmm. right? And these are generally starter homes. They're smaller homes, mm -hmm. 1,500 feet for a three, 2,000 for a four at max. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, they're oh, okay. not, they're so not they huge. Are smaller. They have garages. Yeah. You put garages. They have garages. Okay. Uh, not everybody has it, but we do. When you're doing an attached or sorry uh, an individually platted home mm -hmm. you're doing that there's another camp within btr which is essentially cottage style or horizontal apartments they're calling that right horizontal and so apart so they're attached they're attached okay like but, a townhome but um they but have their own yards story, single, single story, story. Some, some are two but it's still one unit almost like a zero lot line no 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 i'm thinking of something else i think i've got some up the road here actually but uh so so they're attached but but they're single story generally single story there's some groups that are doing two like a living room downstairs and a bedroom upstairs gotcha. they have their own backyards okay and but they're going to be ones twos and studios for the most part oh, no just kidding. like multifamily. Oh, so wow. this sort of is to me it's a little bit in between multifamily and and the way we've envisioned still DTR. desirable you know I, I i look at some of these multifamily assets that are these old 60s built where they've got pitched roofs and they're like four, five, six plexes, eight plexes, but they're single story. Yeah. And they're, they're, those are also very desirable. I mean, they don't look the greatest. A lot of them don't have central air and, and whatnot and, and, or, and or um, you know, they're very small, small windows, low ceilings, but that's, it's very similar to what you're describing here. And they're still very desirable because people that don't have someone living above or below them, just next right. to them. So it's still, like I say, a desirable setup. So you're right. doing that. You're no, we, we haven't done the cottage style yet. Okay. We, we, on that, piece of land in Fort Myers where we've right. got this extra call it 25 acres we're considering multifamily okay. or that but it, it will it will probably wind up being some form of BTR their cottage style or others that would be our first cottage obviously style. the density is less if you're going to do cottage because you can't go horizontal correct or, or vertical correct yeah. so it'd go from about 300 units more vertically right in three right. four-story product to give or take 200 units gotcha. on that piece gotcha. Gotcha. but so that that's our pipeline um 
Wow. Yeah. The reason I'm fascinated, you know, you, you, you don't know a lot about my story, but I had 800 houses along the Gulf Coast of Florida here, but in a two hour direction, each, each direction from where I live, two hours north, two hours south and everywhere in between. And logistically, it was a freaking nightmare. And, and you've managed some SFR, single family residences, so you understand this yeah. dynamic that, uh, as it relates to maintenance and things like that. You know, I tell the story, you know, if I had a maintenance issue at one of my apartment complexes, you can stockpile parts, everything's the same. But if these are all differently built houses, which these were, you know, you've got to go see what's wrong. Might be an hour one way for one of my maintenance guys. And then he's got to find a Home Depot or a Lowe's where we have an account. And I don't know about you, but when Rod tries to fix something, he ends up going to Home Depot more than once. And, you know, and these were C-class houses for the most part that I bought. And so lots of maintenance. And, you know, so literally it, it, it was it that killed the cash flow, yeah. killed it. Yeah. But but I love the model where they're all together because and, and they'll likely have the same appliances, plumbing fixtures, things of that nature. So from a maintenance standpoint, you can have a maintenance room and stockpile parts just like you do in an apartment complex. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 We also do central amenities. So mm. no different. So no different than like a class well, A oh, pool and whatnot. Pool, okay. gym. Nice. Um, you know, bark oh, park. Well. Wow. Yeah. Um, um, nice uh, uh, children's parks. Nice. Um, we're going to be putting in pickleball courts in some of these. Uh, I'm, so I'm putting t- changing a tennis court to pickleball right now in an asset we just bought in San Antonio. I don't mm. even know what pickleball is. I, it's, I guess it's the big rage, but I've I've never tried it or anything. But yeah, I've never played it either. My yeah. partner's big into racket sports. Loves yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. No kidding. Oh, that's funny. So, um, so yeah. So I mean, we we're talking a little bit before we started recording how. You know, you've been, uh, I don't know how you described it, um, where you're just buying, I'm sorry, you're you are building and selling immediately, almost like flipping. How did you, what? Merchant building. Merchant builder, right, yeah. okay. Which is very common, even in the multifamily yeah. space. Somebody will build a big multifamily and they'll they'll get it partly leased up or mostly leased up and or maybe not even leased up and sell it immediately. Uh, but now you're leaning more towards buy and hold. Well, it, it more build and then I mean build, re, build recap and, build. and yeah. hold it, yeah, or, yeah. or you know personally buy these units and, right. and keep holding. You know the, the, I think as we talked about a little bit before, we're nation of renters. Right. That's not going to change. Oh no, we have become a renter nation. No yeah. question. And 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 I think that it only continues. We, we can talk about some of these tailwinds. I think that that are behind the BTR space. And so if I could hold these things forever. Right. There's always sort of a mismatch between capital and sort of the business plan. Right. Mm-hmm. If you want a merchant build, there's plenty of opportunistic capital that wants to do that. They want their money to come in and out real fast. Right. There's some groups that want the value add and they can deal with maybe a little bit longer. Right. There are a lot fewer investors that are willing to take that core plus or that core sort of let's just buy something that has cash flow and hold it or let's lease it up and hold it. They want their money out faster. And so matching capital to the business plan or or your goal is really always the the challenge. Well, I will tell you, you know, our model is we it's kind of the Burr method honestly uh, on a bigger scale. You know, buy, reposition, refinance, get our investors all or most of their money back and they just hold on to the damn thing. Yeah. And you know, unless the market shifts or something like that. And um and so I believe you could absolutely do that in your model. No yeah. question. And uh but uh you know, we, we talked about the, the renter nation piece. You know, there's a huge disparity now between, between uh, what someone can rent a place for and what they can buy it for. It's it's becoming very, very difficult for people to buy at this point. Yeah. And I don't know if that's going to shift, uh, but if not, we're going to continue to move more towards a renter nation. So you talk about tailwinds. What are some of the other tailwinds? Right. So with with apartments, right, like you have somebody who is just mainly starting out, right? For the most part, at first. What do you mean? Oh, you mean like a like a renter, y- younger renter, Got right? They, they they've moved out, they've graduated college, or they're in college, they're working a job. Um, sometimes it winds up as a couple, but generally speaking, and and right, most of the apartment communities that were built, they built only five to seven percent three bedroom units. True, right. And that was from 1990 oh, until see. now. Yeah, and and so at a certain point, you've got all these people who are sort of funneling through this multifamily system, right? They're funneling mm-hmm. through apartments, and at some point. They get a dog Kids. or a kid, yeah. or they, they want to work from home now post COVID. Oh, sure. Right. So, all these things sort of pushing these people and the people who are in the three bedrooms, where would they go? They would eventually go into the home buying market, mm-hmm. right? The home buying market now, as you to your to your point, right. it would cost them from the last study I saw $4,473 inclusive of their mortgage payment, their taxes and their maintenance to own the same unit they can rent from me for about $2,500 a month. Okay. Right. And so it's about a 70% delta. And that, by the way, 
uh, holds nationally, give or take, mm -hmm. in terms of what it costs to rent a home versus what it costs oh, yeah. to, to, to oh, own yeah. it. And so what's that driven by? Well, before uh, the recent uh, uptick in interest rates, we were about 5 million homes short yeah, in the country. That's exactly right. right. That's the number. And from 2012 to call it, I don't know, 2018, somewhere in there, we were forming households, essentially 200,000 more households per year than we were building homes. So the, the number of starts was already sort of not able to keep pace. And that was when rates were low and times were good. And so what happens when rates go up? Okay. Well, building is, is, yeah. has, has almost died at this point. I mean, there's yeah. stuff that was already started, but I've got, I've got a partner. Well, I'm so, I shouldn't say partner. My attorney has 9,000 units and he's struggling to get, he's got some land in Texas. He's struggling to get it capitalized at this point. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's ground to a halt. Right. And so, and so you've got, th that is the tailwind. You've got right. all these people, they're continuing to form their households. And at some point they need to leave multifamily. Right, they need to get something well, bigger, and and right? not to get political, but I'm going to get political. What about the 17 million people that have come across the southern border supposedly in the last year or two right. as well? I mean, these right. people need a place to live, right? And and they're coming to states like ours, the red right. states too. Right. And um, you know, a big proponent of yeah. building building in red states. Yeah, also. Well, same, same. But yeah. um, you know, look, so you've got this huge tailwind of right. people that need space. Yeah. The households are continuing to form, and so what happened during the past two years? Two million home shortage in just the past since 2022 no wow. right so it went from five million homes that we were short before to a shortage of now seven million homes there is nothing that you can do to fix that over the next 20 years because even in good times remember you're only you're adding to the deficit by about 200,000 homes a year yeah. you'd have to up your game substantially during good times to just break even right and so if you have this you have that many people trying to get into a home, but you're not able to to provide that for them. And then in times of higher rates, even when they can perhaps find one, they can't afford it because it's 70% more expensive. Where do you think rents are going to go? They have oh. to go up. Oh, they're Cake. definitely going up. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you know, I, 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 I got interviewed on a couple of podcasts here in the last uh, few couple of months. And, and I, I found some stats, you know, around inflation. Yeah. I don't know if you know that 80% of the currency in circulation right now has been printed in the last four years. I saw something similar. I didn't know yeah. it was 80. Yeah, 80%. So up till 2020, 20% of the currency was was there. In the last four years, 80% more has been, of course, printed out of, not even printed, digitized out of thin air. And so we wonder why there's inflation. And, and you know, the Fed just came out literally yesterday or the day before saying that they have to keep an eye on inflation. They don't know when rates are going to come down. Well, I don't know. I, that they'll ever come down, you know, and, 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 and on that note, I remember, you know, I'm a lot older than you. And I remember when I was 18, interest rates were 18%. And, yeah. and we were doing backflips when they hit 7%, yeah. you know, it was like, holy crap, it's 7%. Can you believe it? So, you know, just to give some contrast. Uh, but so, yeah, I, I, again, I love the model. Um, I, I really love what you're doing. And, and frankly, I'm interested in it myself. Like I said, uh, I think it's it's a no brainer because people people need a place to live and they love having their own place like that versus, you know, I mean, listen, I'm in the apartment business. I love the apartment business. But, you know, I'm just from a common sense standpoint, you know, that people would rather have their own place like that. So. Yeah, there's a place for both, obviously, yeah, you know, yeah. that people are always going to need the apartments at, yeah. a, at a given point in their yeah. life and maybe it at another point in their lives. Yeah. But at some point, they're going to need something bigger. Yeah. And if they can't buy the home, we're going to give them a nice home to rent. So some questions. Yeah. Do, do you, are they are they responsible for the yards? Or are you going to do that like a like a condo kind of a arrangement with some sort of a fee structure? Yeah, so we they'll typically pay a certain amount per month for pest control, mm. yard upkeep, and the rest. But the way that the backyards are set up is they're, they're efficient for someone to go through the different fencing, right, and sort of go through um from one end of the units oh, all gotcha. the way to the uh, other you mean, you mean like a contractor can go can go through the backyards Correct. and do the mowing and all that stuff yeah. oh that's smart yeah we, we manage these no differently than you would manage a garden style multi uh, gotcha. multi-family it's just you're going to have a little bit of nuance that you have to deal with there but we can hire the same gray stars lincoln's um range waters the big property management companies we can hire them to to manage for us so got that, it yeah. got it no i love that but uh, you know the interesting thing is too People tend to take care of these units as if it were a home, right? And so they don't call for maintenance requests as much as they would, let's say, in a multifamily. Mm. And another stat, they're stickier, 
right? So a multifamily, oh, I, I don't know how they, often you They don't you move turn. out as often, yeah. Right. The, the, the average, I think, is usually 50%, 55% stay mm -hmm. in multi. Mm -hmm. For us, it's, um, I think, give or take across SFR and BTR, it's about 25% leave to 28%. No kidding. So you wind up, even though you've got less. bigger units, and theoretically it costs more to turn them. Not theoretically, it does cost more to turn oh, each sure unit. You're just turning less of them. And so the actual per unit turns are very similar to the cost for multifamily just because you're turning fewer units. Well, and you're definitely in the right market, man. You can't keep people away from Florida right now. I was telling mm -hmm. you I should be a poster child for the Florida yeah. Chamber. I love it here so much. And and so, you know, I mean, I mean, I think you've got you've checked off all the right boxes for what you're doing. Um, so so um, you're going to you're, you're looking, you're setting your sights elsewhere in the southeast as well. Like we mm -hmm. are, too. This is this is us for same, same. We love the southeast. Yeah, yeah. we've put out letters of intent from Texas to Tennessee mm -hmm. um, and basically everywhere down. Um, certainly many times in Atlanta and, right. and other places in Georgia, both of the Carolinas. Right. Same. Other select markets we've looked at, right? So, so what's interesting is I was reading yesterday where rents have popped, mm -hmm. and our markets down here are for, for you know SFR call it three to four and a half percent, right? For mm -hmm. BTR as well, right. the An annual increase, annual increase, uh -huh. right? Year over year, mm -hmm. um, the Midwest is on fire. Really? Yeah. Indianapolis, I think, was like 8% year over year. No kidding. Columbus, somewhere there about. Yeah, I've got and an so asset these were, there. Yeah, and these, Indiana's these Indianapolis. were all like 7, 7 plus percent Minneapolis. Nice. Um, I don't know that we'll ever get into the Midwest. You know, I'm from there. We've, we've done a few projects there before I started this, and they actually did well. Where were you at up there? Uh, I grew up in Bloomfield Hills. Oh, that's um, right. You yeah. said that. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I love the Southeast. You know, I used to say this is before, you know, the the world ended in 2008 and 9. I used to say there's 80 million baby boomers getting old and getting cold, you know. So, you know, you like you, anything yeah. South is definitely going to be a home run. And that's still the case. I was just a little early with that thought process. So one of the questions I love to ask is, is as you were, you know, progressing in this business model, um, two things one talk about some 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 seminars that you had i call them f seminars instead of failures or, or setbacks okay yeah. and then secondly um any epiphanies uh you know like aha moments like okay now i get it so, so let's start with the let's start with the pain because huh? you know, everybody thinks this is an easy road and i i know you can, we we all have notebooks filled with pain but think about t tell us about a doozy and the lesson learned so yeah, there are a lot of them. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> there are a lot of them. Especially in the entitlement and dealing with the oh, county God. and the city and they tell you one thing and they do another. I always tell my peeps, you know, if you do if you ever have a communication with a governmental person, document it in freaking writing after the conversation, yeah. right? You agree? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um so so you know, when I was going through all these different jobs that I mentioned at the beginning mm -hmm. of the interview, I really didn't at the time understand real estate finance. Mm. I grew up in real estate my father's a developer. And so oh, okay. I understood, yeah. you know, sort of sticks and bricks, how you build, right. but I never really got the education of what's a cap rate, what's a DSCR, right. you know, n none of that. And so as I'm working my way through these companies and I sat down in my first job and, you know, my first real job in the space. And I looked at the guy's model that I stepped into his shoes, right. And for Harvard MBA, it's got 13, 14 tabs on it. I can't, model for shit for, right. for not I, I have no idea what i'm doing and so i go through and i start to say you know what we are in a a, a, a time in in history where you can actually learn anything you want mm -hmm. if you say you want to do something and you don't do there's it, no excuse there, there are no excuses no. so pulled up property metrics i pulled up um you know uh what's his name um oh um get refm uh bruce kirsch has these great classes oh does he okay. um and so, so I, I sat down and I, I said, I'm going to learn this come hell or high water. And I lost that job. Uh -huh. And at the next job, you know, I kept learning and I kept learning. And finally, I get to a place where I can write an institutional book. Mm. I can model. I know exactly, you know, what this looks like, what it should do. I know that if, you know, something else goes down over here, the lever means it's going to go up over there. Right. And I finally find the deal that I'm going to do, right? And raise capital around this Bradenton deal. No, this oh. is even before oh, that. Before that, okay. Right, and so I go through, um, and I and this guy brings me this really cool deal. It's in an up and coming neighborhood in Miami. And I said, "This is awesome." He says, "I'm going to run it. You raise the money." Great. So I put together a book. I stay at my office every day, real late. 
I go out and it, the, the deal looks amazing on paper. Right. And I go out and I raise my money around it. We sign a contract together. We're joint and several on the contract. And I come to say, I got the money. He goes, yeah, well, about that, you know, I have an investor that I think would be more strategic for me. And I'd like to go in that direction. And so I said, well, but I already raised the money and that was my part of the job, right? So I come through this, call it seven, eight years of having no idea what I'm doing. I finally get to the place where I know what I'm doing. I can document what I'm doing. Uh, I find the deal that I think is going to be my future. It's called getting screwed. You got screwed. Oh, yeah. Wow. And so, but we were joint and several on the contract. Mm. What that so means for everyone. You had a little leverage. You had a little leverage. Right. There. So that means he can't close without me. I can't close without him. He can't cancel the contract without me. I can't cancel without him. And we both have some money up. So at some point, someone's going to have to to give here. And so, you know, I, I won't go through all of it, but I wound up getting bought out of that contract, oh, made a little bit of money needed the money at the time yeah. right yeah. and you know i learned that just because you know what you're doing just because you can find something that makes sense just i raised the money three separate times on that deal wow. and you know through that it learned it, it, you learned a, a ton you yeah. know you learned how to protect yourself going in and all that um you know you talked about struggling through the analysis process the underwriting yeah. process and you know, my boot camps, and I'll just throw a plug in here. You know, you, you get our underwriting software, which was created by one of my partners, and it is kick ass. And it's in, and it really is something you can wrap your arms around with videos and everything else. And that comes with the boot camp. So if you're ever thinking about coming to my boot camp, you know, I have them every few months. Um, you get that with it, and it is really, um, it, it would have saved you a ton of time. I can tell you right Absolutely. now, it's kick ass. But, but, um, yeah, so 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 that was a seven. That was an a, that was a seminar. Now talk about an epiphany, like like maybe a positive epiphany as part of this process. You you alluded to one when you were doing your analysis of 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 uh, returns on that uh, that first deal. But anything else come to mind? Anything as you're as you're progressing in this real estate space? Um, um, and if not, it's fine. You know, it, for, with Build to Rent, it was basically there was going to be an industry that came up around it, yeah. and so. I knew what the returns were like. And, you know, as I was saying before, sort of when I, when, the, when I underwrote this thing, that was an eight and a half, right? I said, okay, this is interesting, but can you lease up this many three Houses? and four bedrooms, right? Uh -huh. So that, that was an easier answer to find out because you look to the SFR markets, mm -hmm. right? The SFR markets at the time were growing four or 5% per year rent growth. Mm -hmm. They were 97, 98%. Okay, okay so you can rent them. Mm -hmm. Then it was, how do you exit? And right. how do you finance it? To, right. They're basically the same question to me at some point, right? Because if you can't finance it, you can't exit it. Correct. Right. And so it wound And by the way, let me explain yeah. why. Because if you can't finance it, whoever wants to buy it can't finance Correct. it either. So they're both the same thing. Got it. Yeah. Right. And so so I start looking through and um, well, SFR, if you really dig into it, that's really trading right around low fours. Mm -hmm. Multifamily at the time was trading low to mid fours, right? Mm -hmm. And so this why wouldn't this trade differently? Well, it's because financing wasn't there to your point. And then all of a sudden it becomes clear you can put multifamily debt on it. You can put agency financing on it. And then it did not matter, right? And so you can put agency debt on a subdivision. Correct. If you own all of the own parcels, everything. correct. What if they're separately titled tax wise? Will they still do it? I think that no. I think no. you have to have title same same correct. same tax. And, and, okay. and so all of a sudden it does not matter what you're at. you are building to Call it an eight, even if I'm wrong, with some right. contingency, and right. your debt's four and a half. You have a 350 basis point spread yeah. between your build to yield, untrended, by, by the way, by no three rent. and a half percent interest, guys. There's Correct. 100 basis points in an interest, uh, one percent interest. Okay, right. And so you've got a three and a half, 350 basis point spread. Right. You, your cash flow is enough to return everything, maybe through a refinance, maybe even not. Right. At that point, your cash flow is sufficient. Right. To get all of your investor capital out in three to five years, depending on what you take out at That's refinance. Fantastic. And so at that point, I said, this is what I'm going to do for the rest yeah. of my life. That's and by the way, there's going to be an industry. There yeah. has to be an industry. We need to go grab as much land as we can before everybody else figures this out. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm totally in agreement. By the way, I think there's a chance you could get conforming debt with different tax parcels. I don't know if they'd want to deal with it, but I mean, I've, I, we've got conforming debt on on um, multifamily properties that have different tax basis also that are near each other 
Uh, so, mm -hmm. so where you can you can combine uh, some properties like that. So there's a, there's a possibility. I you, I don't know. I could be dead wrong on Maybe. that, but but it might be worth considering. But sure. So who else is in this space? And and I mean, do you have any idea how big the market is? I'm sure there's lots of other players, but you know, are there any notable ones? And 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 t talk about the market in general. Sure. So there, there are a number of people, as I mentioned, playing it sort of differently. Some people are doing the cottage style stuff. Right. Most of the people, though, that I know are really doing sort of the single family, um, the single family execution. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the home builders is doing the cottage style version of it. Mm -hmm. Um, another one of the home builders actually figured, you know what, we're going to lease up our own subdivisions no and then we're going to sell them at a cap rate. And yeah, so they actually took that on. Some of the other public builders are doing it where they're sort of engineering whole community sales at one time. And so they're actually not, um, and some of these, by the way, were never intended to be right. rentals. Right. They just sold the whole community. And so it wasn't really built for rent, but right. the buyer said, this is BTR. The whole name's weird, but um, oh no, that makes sense. Yeah. So they built a subdivision and 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 they sell it to one buyer. That's it. And wow. so that person has a build to rent project, even though it wasn't right. built to rent, right? Um, which I do find funny. But um, look, there there are some other groups in in there that have been really sort of off to the races. There's a group um, out of Atlanta called Quinn. Mm. They're up to about five thousand units. They raise money. Um, mm. Richard's a friend, mm. um, and they're I think you know probably one of the standard bearers um, here. Um, Predium, right? Progress Residential. They've gotten into the build to rent space. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of the big institutions have done it well. JP Morgan was backed. Um, uh, what was the group's name? Suda Ready was the gentleman's there, Haven Realty Capital. So they were big into the BTR space. There's a group in Texas called Wanbridge that's doing it. Um, there are a well, number of groups, okay. groups right, that so, are into so the it's space. It's but becoming more and more prevalent. Yeah. But, you know, whereas some of the, if you look at multifamily, some of these large REITs are. 25,000, 30, 40,000 units, it's really difficult to get this scale in BTR. If you have 5,000 units, you're essentially equivalent to a REIT that's got, you know, 20, 30,000 sure. in multi sure. because you can't find the land. You can't find 30, 40 acres at the cloverleaf you want to be at, right? right? At, 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 at the interchange. It's just right. very difficult. So, so talk about some of the things you look for when you're identifying land. Uh, so, so what are some what are some of the things that that you must have, and some of the things that you'd like to have when you're and, and you know size wise, location wise, et cetera. So we don't really want to get below call it ten to twelve acres. We really want to be able to get to ninety to hundred units okay. where it makes sense, where you have enough density to put a um, an amenity center. Okay. Right below that, you really can't do it. It's right. not really efficient Even to manage. Twelve acres. I mean, I'm on two acres here. How do you? How many homes can you get on twelve acres? You can typically get, call it seven, seven townhomes. Oh, okay. Right, twenty okay. foot wide. Okay. Towns. Okay. Um, okay. So that's one. Two. The very next thing we're going to look at is what's the retail around it, right? Mm, yeah. You is it see, Starbucks, the, Whole Foods? Right. right? You're going to try. I to, tell the same people, same thing in multifamily. You want you want national retailers. You don't want Bob's Burgers and sushi. Right. You want freaking Home Depot, Starbucks. Right. I want I want to see a Starbucks near anything I buy. Hundred percent. Yeah. And then we're going to look at schools, right? Because schools. It's different oh, from multifamily. Yeah, three bedrooms. Right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you can pull up you know Zillow or great mm -hmm. schools, and mm -hmm. you do an average of the. Uh, we do an average of the elementary, middle, and high schools to figure out. We want to be at least at a five, right? We want to be, but, but typically better. Oh, we're so gonna, it's one to ten is correct. the rating. Got gotcha. you. So five, got at, it. at okay. least, um, and that's sort of the the, the cutoff. Okay. Um, we also will look at um, household income, median oh, of household course, income, of course. Of course. Of course. Um, proximity to major transportation, a mm -hmm. highway, um, jobs. Right. And well, jobs so, is the biggest thing. Yeah. That's jobs is the biggest. I mean, that's at least in my space. That's yeah. the biggest thing. Uh, and and um, what did you say before proximity to a cloverleaf? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, in a lot of these demographics, guys, you can go in um, city hyphen data dot com, best places dot net, data USA dot IO, census dot gov. All of those will help you find this demographical information that he's talking about here. Median income, mm -hmm. household income. You know, do you look at the median home price as well? Do you ever look at that for disparity? Um, it's not one of the first things we'll look at. Right. We'll, we'll look to see, can we build to at least a place where we're not overpaying retail for, for what Got we're it. building? Yeah. We don't want to build to 400 a, a unit when, right. you know, the market's 350. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. We don't mind necessarily meeting market or being slightly under market. Okay. But yeah, absolutely. No, our our first sense. project in Bradenton though was, was interesting because next door you had um, one of the sort of entry level products from one of the big publicly traded mm -hmm. home builders 
trading at let's say 320 a unit, 360 a unit, and then across uh, the, the the major road you had the inlets um, there where these are all waterfront homes right. north of a million. Right. Yeah. You know, a lot of those are very similar to what we do in the apartment communities, obviously, as well. A lot of similarity to that. Well, listen, Adam, I really appreciate you coming down here and meeting with me. Um, guys, it's um, it's Wolfson BTR. What's your website? It's um, wolfsondevelopment.com. Okay, Wolfson yeah. spelled wolf just like the animal, son, wolfsondevelopment.com. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm very interested, so I'm definitely going to stay in touch with you because I, I'd like to do some small stuff with my boy. You know, maybe the 12 acres, like you described, yeah. do some of those little townhouse communities. You know, um, to me, that's there's no greater hedge against inflation because, like we talked about, inflation and 80% of the currency being printed in the last four years. You know, inflation impacts rents. You know, Absolutely. doesn't it, and and so you know if you've got for, if you've got debt that's solid. You know, your debt's not going up and your rents are going up. Your value's exponentially right. going up. It's a no-brainer. I, I think we're going to wind up with more, call it 25% jumps in values given where rents are going because yeah. rents are going to exceed the growth in expenses. Yeah. Um, KKR just bought um, essentially 5,000 plus units from Quartero in our multifamily. No and they said, hey, listen, rents are going up. It's a unique moment in time. Yeah. They've called the bottom, in my opinion, at that point. Really? Black, Blackstone just went out and bought $10, $10 billion. They bought air communities, right? And then they, on the heels of that, they just bought Tricon. I think they spent another $3.5 billion. Yeah. They've called so, the bottom. Yeah, They're telling us where it's going. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, brother. I appreciate Likewise. you coming down. All right. So one other quick thing. We encounter so many people that are, frankly, frustrated. You know, they're looking in the mirror and they're frustrated that they haven't been able to escape the rat race. They haven't been able to build cash flow to the point where they're able to have financial and time freedom with their families. You know, and maybe they see other people buying real estate and creating, you know, incredible cash flow. And they think, well, it's just scary. You know, buying apartments is intimidating. And I get it. But see, that's why we created our Warrior Mentorship Program. They're our coaching students and they've had extraordinary results. My students, I've been teaching about five years and own upwards of 140,000 units now that we know of, right? And we feel like it's just getting going. Now we're looking to grow this group and really take it to the next level. And honestly believe that the greatest transfer of wealth could be upon us right now with this current economic environment. Everything's going on sale. So we're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework, really like a blueprint or a map, literally step by step. And then they're able to leverage our systems and our incredible network to raise money and equity, to find deals and close those deals and build partnerships really nationwide. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more in our incredible network and take advantage of the unbelievable opportunities that are upon us, you can apply to my Warrior Mentorship Program by texting the word CRUSH to 72345, or you can go to mentorwithrod.com. And what we'll do is we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out and see if it's a fit. Now, again, you can go to mentorwithrod.com or text the word CRUSH to 72345 to apply, and we will speak soon.